we continue on Spanish Jamaica. He's only 39 years old, and Jamaica's the fastest rising political star. We are now joined by the Honorable Andrew Holness, Jamaica's ninth Prime Minister. Good morning, sir. Good Welcome morning, to Smile morning. Jamaica. And thank you so much for coming, sir. My great pleasure in being with you. Um, what was the feeling like when you realized that I'm 39 and I'm the Prime Minister of Jamaica? What was that feeling like? I'll be honest with you, it, it didn't feel any different from how I felt before. I mean, I've always acknowledged the awesome responsibility of leading one's country. I've always wanted to do this. So mentally, I've always been prepared for this. So the transition is not that great mentally, no. You said you always wanted to do it, but when you realized that maybe I will get it, did you think, no, maybe I, I shouldn't, maybe I'm not ready for this? Yet. It's the fulfillment of um, a dream, an aspiration, uh, a duty almost. I've spoken to, to past prime ministers and the, the amount of time in the day that you have for yourself, for quiet reflection or family or so on, seems to be limited. It's a lot of hours on the job. Why would anybody want that? And it's a you calling. Said you wanted it from. It's a, it's a calling. For me, it's a calling. It's, this is what I've lived my life to do. So <clears throat> I'm prepared to accept the responsibilities that come with it. And I've, I've always been prepared to do this. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the time management, that's a skill that you refine as you go along. I've tried to live my life in a balanced way, to take care of family, of your own peace of mind, your health, um, your friends, and to dedicate enough time to your job. Um, as prime minister, you have to spend more time on strategic issues rather than on management issues. So the assembling of a team that can manage strategy implementation is critical. And you have to acknowledge and recognize you can't do it alone. Um, so the ability to inspire people to work, um, inspire people to think, and inspire people to maintain an integral stand, very important. You, you mentioned that. Um which is about the ability to delegate and have confidence in the people that you have around you and obviously you you tweaked your cabinet somewhat but you've held on to education which I'm sure from your previous experience you realize is is not an easy task um, you would be in charge of defense and of course the prime ministerial duties now you you have all the energy of a 39 year old but that that's a lot of responsibility well, <coughs> let's let's clear that up I mean they the strategy behind education is that I've spent four years developing policy. We are now at the phase of implementation. implementation. So much of that relies on the civil service. So my job now shifts to more of an oversight capacity and an evaluation capacity. Are the policies being implemented properly? And where are they falling down? And what are the changes that need to be made? I suspect that implementation of the policies that we've put in place will last for maybe another year. And we're very advanced in implementation as well. We're establishing institutions that will take policy and run those policies. So I'm, I'm confident in where we are in, in, in education. Eventually, I'll have to divest myself of it because there are other issues that I mm -hmm. want to focus my attention on. Uh, national defense, you know, Jamaica must be proud of the JDF. So my focus there clearly is not operational. It's basically policy. Um, OPM that has an amalgam of, of you know, differing subject areas, and I am getting to know those. Some of them I'm familiar with already, so the learning curve won't be steep. So uh, I'm not um, you know, overly um, stressed with the portfolio that I have. The political analysts have all chipped in and decided to tell you where you should put your focus. You just said you have other issues. What are the burning issues right now? The burning issue, the critical issue, is to return fiscal discipline. Um, to our economic management, to ensure that we fulfill our obligations with our international funding partners, the IMF, the IDB, the World Bank, and uh, to continue our progress as it relates to crime fighting, growth, jobs. Burning issues, clearly. Let's, let's start with the IMF. Um, the discussion publicly has been around the fact that we still don't know if we've rearranged targets. We still don't know about our ability to draw down from the fund in the future. 
you obviously one of the first things you did with, with the, your predecessor was to go off to Washington to meet with IMF. What is happening in that regard and how will your approach to uh, well, negotiations <coughs> with the IMF be well, different? Uh, well, let's deal with these issues. Um, when we went to the IMF, we went uh, on a program. And the objective of the program was clearly to uh, return stability to our uh, macro indicators, strategically to reduce debt and debt servicing, and uh, to place us on a path for growth. That program required us to take certain decisions, critical decisions about the management of expenditure, managing inflation, managing our reserves, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, at some point, we reached a critical juncture as it relates to wages and wage expectations. And that caused what e economic analysts would call a confidence issue. Mm -hmm. So our IFIs are looking at the government saying, um, will we carry out the program that we agreed to? Um, there has been a little delay. Um, the transition has also added. And that's why we have had to be very careful in managing the transition that we don't affect the program. So we are now on a path of restoring confidence. Um, we have been talking, and that means that we have to also talk to the various sectors because it is not just the government that has to make a decision. Mm -hmm. It is the various sectors in the society that has to sit down and come to an understanding that let us all agree to complete the program, place us on a path for growth, and then we decide afterwards how the growth is shared. But and just that as an addendum to now. that, yeah. the, 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 the concern among some of those sectors, including the private sector, is that the initial agreement with the IMF was um, ambitious, to say the least, in terms of what we could achieve in, in what conditionalities right, we so could agree to. Now, you know, are this you is, negotiating I'm not a going change to, I'm, not, I'm not going to comment on whether the, the agreement was ambitious. The, the government sat down and made some projections. It was agreed that, you know, as you go along within the program, there's, you know, room and scope, mm -hmm. but you don't do that too, too often. Our plan is to establish confidence. Now, now let's just be clear. Confidence it's not just important for satisfying the IMF. This is not, Jamaica is not trying to satisfy the IMF. Right. What is being required is necessary to be done to give confidence to our business sector so that our business sector understands that if the government says we're going to do this, for example, reduce our interest rates, our business sector will be able to say, I can plan because the government keeps its word government policy is stable. So it's very important, not just for the IMF, it's important for public policy and economic policy as well. Going back to, uh, a lot has been made about the fact that you're a, a young prime minister, you're only 30. You know, I'm not quite young. <laughs> <laughs> you are, if, if compared to me, you are, sir. Um, do you feel under pressure that, that, that everyone says, well, this is going to be a great change from what we're accustomed uh, to because uh, we, we have Managing expectations is very important mm. to me. So I don't go off on a frolic, giving people false hope. I want to give people hope, but hope has to be within the bounds of what is realistic, what can be achieved. So there are things that I believe that is within the realm of, of, of um, our achievement, and I think we should strive for those. But I'm not going to lie and say that tomorrow it will be milk and honey. Mm. Yeah. That's not the case. I've been, I think I've been very clear to people that we will have to, maybe for a year, maybe for two years, um, engage in a program of realism about our finances, about how we arrange our economics. And uh, whilst we do that, we must, and I want to stress that, protect the poor, the persons who are, uh, and the working poor, not just persons who are you know, absolutely poor, but the working poor as well. So in effect, I'm saying that this government will be a fair government. We will pursue fiscal discipline, we will protect the poor, and set the stage finally for this country to grow. I just wonder if, if those two go hand in hand and, and if a lot of that isn't platitudes in that 
we, we look to be fiscally responsible because usually when governments tend to be fiscally responsible, they tend to cut health, education, and the poor suffer. And I, I don't know. You if know, that's you, you've asked a very good question. Very good question because the, uh, the debate so far in Jamaica is that you can't be efficient and be equitable mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. and that's our economic policy. And that's how it has gone. This government changed that. We selected some areas that are important for equity. Health, education, social safety net. No one can say that we have not expanded the social safety net. We have maintained access to education, indeed increased access to education. Right now we have moved from 72% of the secondary age population being in high school to 82% of the secondary age population being in high school. That's a massive jump in four years. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have expanded access in education. But at the same time, the poverty figures have doubled. Well, you know, the poverty debate needs to be had because much of what is said, it's not clearly explained. We had a, 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 a fall in poverty that was due to a wealth effect created mm -hmm. by <coughs> the what we call the unregulated financial schemes and that caused poverty to dip significantly beyond no, the normal trajectory but just coming out after the the collapse of those schemes poverty took a rise obviously it would but then it is also compounded by a recession in our biggest foreign exchange earning mm -hmm. markets mm -hmm. the US mm -hmm. and Europe so so you know almost 50 percent of um, remittances go straight so into consumption. So there's a direct correlation. Yeah. So it's not that you have, you know, clearly there is new poverty as a result of, 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 of losing jobs. But, but the truth must be told as to why it is that poverty has risen. And poverty has not just risen in Jamaica. Let's be clear. Mm. Statistics are showing that in the United States and in Europe. But we have managed to, to, to have both pathways um, being pursued. Fiscal discipline, and uh, um, being equitable with ensuring access to education, access to health care, and protecting those who are vulnerable. If we can continue on that path, and this is why I know it's important that the sectors keep talking, because if the sectors have expectations of government expenditure, that we can't this juncture again, where the persons who have assisted you, the IMF and the others with your balance of payments, will be wondering, will these people keep their word so that the funds that they have lent us are secured? I did have a, a related question that I was going to sure. ask a little later on, but since you brought up, for instance, the fa failed um, unregulated schemes that we've had in, in the recent past, but it, it also speaks to a number of investigations that are ongoing, that are out there, that seem to have no conclusion. For instance, one of those schemes, the, the main proprietor of that scheme still hasn't been brought before the courts. Um, we have the situation with uh, Joseph Hibbert still hasn't been brought before the courts. Um, the current still hasn't been settled. Um, the contractor general suggests that some 40 submissions have been made to the DPP. Not one of them has come to court. Is that a concern for you as you, as you speak about transparency, yes. as you speak about a, a, a new government direction, that there are still so many outstanding issues that to the average Jamaican who's, if, if he falls afoul of the law, seems to go straight through the process without, without any... Um, it's a challenge, uh, and, and I would want Jamaicans to understand that the powers of the Prime Minister and the government is not limitless, and there are institutions that we have to respect. For example, the Contractor General is an independent institution. Mm -hmm. So too is the DPP. DPP. They are independent institutions. We can't sit here and pretend to be able to direct independent institutions. But it must be a concern. We, we, no, I just wanted to lay that <coughs> clearly. But it is a concern, and we have said so. The role of government, therefore, is to use its legislative powers, which I have said clearly that the new anti-corruption bill will be passed by this administration. It must also use policy. So sometimes policy can't be retroactive. Policy sometimes is just going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to set policies that would prevent, and I think we have done so, the <coughs> occurrence of what happened with the unregulated schemes. Um, we also 
must use our role as advocates against corruption. And I think you will find that more so in this government as well to not just pass the laws and the policy, but to be staunch advocates against corruption. But what, no, but even, no. even the, the, the 70, I forgot to sure. mention in the question, the 73 people or so who were killed in, in Tivoli during yeah, the But that's a separate... There's, there's that's no a, investigation, there's no... Um, report on how these people died? I mean, yeah. that is still I think, a, a I think though, don't, don't confuse the two issues. Um, the, the action of the state, uh, in my opinion, when it relates to its citizens, must always face some kind of oversight as to whether or not it is going to be a commission mm -hmm. which has pros and cons. We have seen commissions come out inconclusive, great deal of expenditure. It's something that we have to, 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 to look at. I couldn't hear make a commitment, but my, my personal view is that when the state takes action against its citizens, and especially resulting in loss of life, there must be some form of oversight and closure and where compensation is, is due, that should be done as well. Sir, in your inaugural speech, you said you have to dismantle garrison communities. Yes. What does that mean first, and how do you uh, achieve well, it? I, you know, I, the leader of the opposition has responded to me. Um, I would say, it's a favorable response. She wants to discuss, we, I want to discuss as well. Um, it's not just symbolism, but I think the symbolism is important, especially coming up to an election. But when you say dismantle it. No, no, and I'm gonna answer your question. Yeah. So um, the garrison is a social construct. It is built in the culture, in the minds of people, that there is an exclusive zone, that only one political view can flourish. But having that one political view flourishing, it gives support to um, what I would call an entry into the state. And having that entry and association with the state authority, sometimes it creates an exclusive zone mm -hmm. where persons who are not necessarily supporting law and order can flourish and sometimes create within your culture, subculture, and within your state, a small state. And we have to be very careful of that. And so the, the biggest that's it. one of those is, is that's West the social. Kingston. Does that's that it. mean you that's would it. not go to West Kingston to assume that that? I think it is. I think. I think. Uh, let's, let's just be clear. I think it, it is, uh, or it is emerging now that I will not be going yeah. to 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 West Kingston. But not for that reason. I have an obligation to the people of West Central Saint Andrew who have supported me through thick and thin, mm -hmm. and it would be unfair to them. But let's just go back. To it is not the yeah to, to, right so because yeah, very important, the people who live in these areas should not be stigmatized. I, as I said in my speech, it is not so much that Jamaica is locked off from them, but they are also locked off from Jamaica. They don't receive from the state all the services with the speed of response mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. quality that they deserve to. And what we need to have now is an integration, easy access into those areas so that you can um, cross-fertilize ideas. People can feel free. It's, it's sad that when you, if, if you are a Jamaican coming from any other part of Jamaica and you end up in an area that is known as a garrison, you feel deathly afraid that mm. something is going to happen to you. Nothing may happen, but just the, the culture, you feel so much afraid. Part of the concern yeah. is, is, for me, in, in terms of those constituencies, they're usually poor Well, well let's not just say constituencies. Because they may be communities. Commun well, even so, yeah. is, is the lack of investment Precisely. and the lack of, it would seem, the sitting MP's ability to attract investment to those communities because of that stigma. Well, how, <coughs> how are you going to change that? How are you going to break well, well, down well, tribalism and, and, and those things well, that let's, directly let's, let's break down investment. It's very important. Many of these communities are not in the industrial belt where investment would come in large quantities, mm -hmm. all right? But they certainly, many of them, were former residential estates. And people who own property there left as a result of violence. And the real estate value has been allowed to deteriorate. Yeah. So the, the, the plan is not just to walk, but there has to be a program of urban renewal where persons can get value in their property. And that's a form of investment as well. And once people start to have value in their property, then they start to have pride in their community 
and they will begin to make a stance against crime and violence. But so, that so sounds good, but is there, is there, a, is there a methodology there, to There to is a methodology, that? and the first thing is to break the view, even if it is not real, that garrisons have political support. Mm. Yeah. That's with Jamaicans. Once that is broken, then the person who comes into the garrison for crime realizes that he has no sucker from the politician. And that must be clearly established. That's a process of trust building. And once we establish that, that will help. You said that walking together. You invited the opposition leader to, to take a walk with you. You said you heard from the opposition Yes, and leader. I'm, I'm, I'm going to review your letter carefully. I got it yesterday. I, I read it in a personal way. I will review it this morning. But it seemed positive to me. Um, speaking of walking with the, the opposition, you, you may get the chance to do it sooner than you think, or than we know, <laughs> uh, which, of course, leads to the next question. Election date. But... You're not asking me to I am that. asking no, you that, but you here's what I'm going to ask you. Is, it, is Jamaica financially, economically, and all the other illies in a position to have an election anytime soon? Listen, as again, I, I'm a realistic person. Um, if you don't have the money, you can't have an election. I agree with the position that standards must be maintained. Um, you certainly don't want to have an election where it is below standard and being criticized internationally. So, you know, we're practical. We bear that in mind. Having said that, we have in Jamaica probably recognized as one of the best electoral institutions in the world. Um, they have gotten so many accolades. Mm -hmm. And they maintain a standing capacity to keep elections if it were to be called. Let's just be clear on this. Let's be clear on this point that the, the electoral machinery must always be ready to give the government the capacity to make a decision. So there is a standing capacity as to what that it is now. Governments have to be realistic. Governments have to keep talking. But would it be purely political expedience to have an election now, to, to ride on the, the bounce that clearly you've given the party, you've been able to close the gap with the PNP, you're, you know, let you're me, a let me, popular let me, let me say something to you, person. Uh, Simon. I, 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 um, I've had to wrestle with the idea of expediency versus what is right. And I'm going to do what is right. One final question, sir. How about the, the children? What do they feel? They, they, you know, they're still trying to... They're they understand understand fully that understand. That understand. <laughs> no, they're still wrestling with it. They're, you know, we've, we've, I want my children to have a fair chance and a normal life. Um, so they're still... You know, they, they understand what I do. You know, I was in politics before they were born, so they, they understand. They know the word constituency. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, uh, they, they're still coming to grips with, with you know, with, with the additional responsibilities. And uh, I still spend a lot of time with them. I used to do quite a bit of riding and walking and playing with them as much as I can. They're, they're, they're good. Congrats, they're good. sir. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I, I just have one more, and it, it relates to something that we've spoken about before when you've come here as Minister of Education. And that is, no matter what government does, um, no matter what policies you put in place, if we do not improve the standard of parenting, which clearly you benefited from, um, and the importance of the family unit, um, we are always going to have certain problems. Is there anything you can do that is going to be different in that regard into improving proper parenting? Pre precisely. And so on? In fact, we have the parenting policy now <coughs> finished. We have the National Parenting Commission draft bill to present legislation will be developed as a result of the policy. As I said, now we are in the implementation stage. You and I are at one. Uh, parenting is critical, not just to social development, but to economic development. Mm. What you pass on to your kids in terms of work ethic, productivity, parenting for creativity, that comes into the economy. All right, sir. I, I also realize that you'll get one more vote for the GLP. Your father said, he might, he might find you know, I more. come from a, 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 a multicultural, <laughs> multi-political background. <laughs> so. Great to see you, sir, and good luck. God good bless. having me. Andrew Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica. All right, still to come. Huh?
and smile at petition against new luggage policies mm -hmm. by some airlines. But before that, stay tuned. What is the Prime Minister going to do about that, I wonder? I, I don't know. We, we have to sort out the luggage issue. All right. We'll soon come. Stay with us, please.